G'day everyone and welcome to another interesting toolbox talk. I want to ask you a question. What if something happened to you or a loved one? Would you or they know what care the other would like and to what extent? We would ask them, wouldn't we? What kind of care and treatment they would want? Well, what if they couldn't tell you or you tell them? Our topic today is advanced care planning, or in other words, putting together an advanced care directive. Not a will or a power of attorney, but instructions for others to follow, a plan for your future health care in case you can't tell others at the time. Advanced Care Planning Australia, the not-for-profit organisation, is a government-funded support program administered by Austin Health, based in Melbourne. The program has a national focus covering all aspects of advanced care planning. Now that's advanced, not, don't put a D on the end. I always put a D on the end for some reason. Advanced care planning. Because information differs in, in all the states. We've had a disclaimer on the, uh, in the chat forum. And speaking of the chat forum, you can ask questions uh, to our presenter or to myself in that uh, little chat section. And uh, we'll come to that maybe at the end of the presentation. But because the information is different all over the place, information today about advanced care uh, planning uh, is in general nature. You may need to seek your own legal or health advice that's relevant to your own circumstances in your state. But we do hope it sees you seeking more information and helps you start a conversation with you, between you and your loved ones. Today, we're joined by Catherine Kelly, one of Advanced Care Planning's uh, Australian volunteers uh, and a community ambassador. Welcome, Catherine. Good morning, Stuart. How are you? Wonderful. Thank you very much for joining us here today uh, and to come and share this very important uh, in information. Catherine, I read uh, just here in your background that you're a retired nurse uh, and you've been volunteering for Advanced Care Planning for the past 10 years. Mm -hmm. That must give you a wealth of knowledge and personal experience to share. Please tell us what you mean by advanced care planning and what are the benefits of having a plan? Okay, Stuart. Well, it might surprise you if I let you know that advanced care planning preserves one of our basic human rights. Okay. Uh, it allows us to keep making decisions about the sort of medical care we want to receive and not want to receive. It's sort of like a, a personal insurance plan that we take out for ourselves. Mm. Everyone, advanced care planning is not compulsory. I need to say that first off, but okay. hopefully people will <coughs> see it as the opportunity that it provides us. Um, every Australian, uh, every adult Australian can choose and appoint a trusted person to make those sorts of decisions for themselves and they can inform their what we call we call that a substitute decision maker they can inform their substitute decision maker about how they want those decisions made for them by firstly thinking carefully and clarifying their own thoughts about uh, their preferences for care their values in life and their attitudes to medical, uh, medical care in general. And then they need to talk to their substitute decision maker. This won't be just one conversation. It'll probably be an ongoing conversation with their substitute decision maker and other close family members as well. And then hopefully at the end of that process, um, people will be able to write an advanced care directive type document to document their wishes for care. So that's basically what advanced care planning um, is about. Um, about 30 to 50 percent of us will lose our ability to make our decisions about our medical care at some time for a whole lot of reasons. Um, and so that's why it's important to uh, think about and talk about our preferences for medical care well in advance. Um, when we're um, when we're able to do it, and not wait until our health is our health is in a bit of a um, uh, a bit of a crisis. Lots of people have have said things like, "I don't think I'm old enough or sick enough 
to worry about my future medical care. <clears throat> but invariably, a lot of them, when they find out that, well, they discover that they are old enough and sick enough, they're no longer able to do it mm. because they've no longer got that um, ability. They're no longer competent. So they, they've missed the boat, which is a great, um, uh, which is a great shame. Yeah. Okay. Now you, you mentioned uh, they're not competent. Um, mm. Would that, uh, I suppose my, my question there would be, do, do you need to have the capacity to make these decisions and choices yourself? And is what you're doing is transferring that capacity to make those decisions to another person, someone that you uh, yes. know personally? Is that, is yeah, that... that's, well, uh, yes, it, it can be a family, it can be a family member, which a lot of people choose, or it can be a trusted mm. friend. Okay. And um, you, you transfer the authority that you've got to make your own decisions. You transfer that in a legal process by appointing them uh, in a formal way. Uh, yeah. You transfer that authority to another person should they need to lose uh, use it. Yeah. So this this isn't like a power of attorney. That that power of attorney is a totally different thing, isn't it? You you're giving someone the right to operate on your behalf, but not in regards to the physical. It is it is a type of power of attorney. It's a mm -hmm. um, specific power of attorney that gives someone else authority to make decisions about medical treatment. Um, so nothing all, to do all, with financial? No. Yeah, okay. <laughs> definitely not, no. All, all powers of attorney are definitely not created equal. So yep. you, need to, you need to make sure that you've got the correct, the correct document, the correct appointment that's yeah. relevant for the state or territory where you live, Stuart. Okay, so this sounds very important. Uh, so a, a very important thing to, for, for us to actually uh, have prepared. Um, I, I remember when my wife and I bought our first house, Mm. And, I, and I said, well, it's important that we'll go, we should go and get a will done. Mm. And, and my wife was like, oh, I don't want to even talk about that. Uh, and yeah. sometimes it's a very hard uh, subject to broach uh, for anybody because we're talking about end of, end of uh, life planning almost. Uh, but not even then. What if you have a, like a, a car accident? Um, and you're, you haven't got the capacity to share? Is this what That's we're right. talking about? Those yes, instances? And our capacity or our ability, capacity is a legal term right. and competent is a legal term. But basically what it means is your ability to yeah. undertake complex thinking, um, thinking tasks. And making decisions about medical treatment is certainly, um, certainly requires complex um, thinking abilities. Uh, each, each state, I'll show you, every, every state in Australia uses basically the, the, four, um, the same four-step definition to talk okay. about what capacity <clears throat> is. So we might just have a look at, um, we might just have a look at that. Here we are here. So until you lose your capacity, and most of us really won't know that we're going to lose our capacity until it happens. Mm -hmm. And then unfortunately, by the time it's happened, um, many of us may have lost too much capacity that we can't undertake advanced care planning at all, which is mm. which is a shame again. But when we're thinking about capacity, there's the four-step legal definition that's used, and it's people have to understand the information about the decision to be made. And in this instance, we're talking about a decision about medical treatment. Mm -hmm. They have to be able to remember the information long enough to make a decision. They have to be able to use the information they've been given to ask questions, consider options, to weigh up the information and to make a decision. And then they need to be able to communicate that decision to others in some way. And unless people can satisfy each of those four steps in that definition, mm -hmm. they're not said to have had, they do not have legal capacity. Okay. So that's what it is. And the same thing applies to... Uh, appointing a decision maker for yourself yeah. you have to have capacity to enable you to do that and the same thing applies to the person that you appoint for you to make decisions about your medical care on your behalf they need to be competent as well so capacity is a really important okay so if you lose your capacity mm -hmm. your doctors will refer to your what's called your substitute decision maker 
Now that's a generic um, substitute decision maker, um, Stuart, you might hear that term a lot. It's a generic term that's used right across Australia because we don't have any national legislation around advanced care planning. So each state or territory has their own process and uh -huh. they have their own name that is relevant in that jurisdiction. Okay, so that's why our presentation is general in nature. Um, that's right. Is it, that's it, it could, we, we don't want to confuse everything. So actually a lot of this information, um, Catherine, is actually on Advanced Care Planning's website, uh, which we'll, we'll promote at the end of the thing. So uh, anybody listening, um, just wait until the end and we'll show you the, uh, the, the, uh, the link to, to the web page, uh, web page and website and so on. Okay. And where you can talking, get more information. Yeah, when we're yeah. talking about the um, generally nature, that, mm -hmm. that applies to the, uh, that we're not legally qualified and we're not yeah. medically qualified. So we can't give people specific information and that's why we'll refer you to appropriate um, other resources for that. Absolutely true that. Yeah. Okay, so just to be clear, uh, you must have capacity yourself personally to make mm -hmm. a decision about your, your uh, medical, yeah. or you must have a substitute decision maker. Who would, who would you uh, uh, suggest a, a substitute decision maker would be, and how would you choose one? Okay, well, that's um, just, we'll just move on to the next slide. Okay, there we are. If you just okay. want to keep your slides up uh, and we'll just go from there. Are you happy with that? Okay, yep, that's yep. fine. All right yep. then. Okay, so um, your substitute decision maker is a really important person um, mm. in your life because of the type of authority you're transferring to another person. Mm -hmm. So they can only make healthcare decisions for you when you become unable to do it. Until that time happens, you may not lose your decision-making capacity, but none of us, none of us really know. Apart from people with a um, uh, who have dementia, who will not, who know definitely that they will lose their decision-making capacity. Um, most of the time, that we we we've got no idea whether it's going to be um, us or not who will lose their decision-making capacity. So you keep on making your own decisions about your own medical care for as long as you as long as you can. Mm -hmm. And your substitute decision maker only assumes authority to make those decisions on your behalf when you can't do it for yourself any longer. They can consent to treatment and they can refuse treatment on your behalf. And because they can do that, that's why you talking to them is so important because they're required under law to use what's called substituted judgment. They make decisions not because they think it's a good idea themselves or not mm. because it's what they would choose for themselves, but they're required by our laws around Australia to make the decisions that they believe you would make yourself. Mm -hmm. And when you appoint them, you're only giving them authority. You're not telling them anything about how you want those decisions made on your behalf. Okay. So when, when you're choosing your substitute decision maker, think carefully. Mm. and take the time to pick a good substitute decision maker because if you choose one who can't do the job, who's not fit for purpose, uh -huh. it, it, you may as well not have one. So it's, important, it's an important role that you're asking somebody to undertake on your behalf. Um, it is a big role with, with considerable responsibility and a lot of people, um, thankfully, are very feel very privileged that you've asked them to do this yeah. for, um, for you. So they need to be, they need to be um, someone you trust. That goes, without, that goes without saying because of the types of decisions they yeah. may need to ask for you. Yeah. Uh, someone with a close and continuing relationship with you. Um, ideally, they need to live in the same city or region. They need to be, they need to be easily contactable. Um, that doesn't that doesn't rule out someone living overseas because for some people that's the only person yeah. um, they've got they've got no one in Australia with them. They need to be over the eighteen, over eighteen, and they need to. This is the part here about being fit for purpose. It's no good appointing someone because you you love them. They're mm -hmm. your favourite grandson or something like that, or your favourite son or daughter. They do have to be fit for purpose. And that means they need to be able to establish an ongoing dialogue with your treating doctors so yeah. that they're 
informed as to what's happening to your, um, your health. They need to be able to ask um, questions. Some people get quite overwhelmed when they're in a healthcare sort of situation. Mm -hmm. um, and they need to be able to, someone who can keep their head um, when, pe when you would normally be pretty stressed and emotional. Yeah. Um, someone, who, yeah, someone who can keep their head in a stressful situation and ask the questions that they need to to get the information they need yeah. to make questions on your behalf. And some health professionals, some doctors are, are good communicators and others are mm, not, not good. So yeah. you, you need to have a little bit of um, chutzpah, is what <laughs> I call it, to be able to ask the questions that give you the information that you need. And the last thing is they obviously need to know your preferences and what's important to you, your, your values in life and things like that. Yeah. Okay. So you would broach um, questions about, you know, uh, being tube fed and, um, you know, where, where, whether you need certain procedures. If we've, we've found generally uh, mm -hmm. some people do try and do it from, they try and think of every single quest, every single, every single treatment that could be offered to them. What happens if you forget one? Um, then, so yeah. we'd always recommend people think of it in much broader terms about what quality of life is for you uh -huh. and what treatment outcomes you want to, you need to have. There are, there's a lot of things coming up there. What, yeah. what treatment outcomes you need to have to give you a minimal level of quality of life from your perspective. Now, cool. on, I'll go through some of these um, yeah. very, very briefly, but we have our healthcare system, thankfully, is such a complex and such a good quality healthcare system. And we're really, we are really, um, we are really privileged to be able to access that sort of healthcare system because other people in Australia, can't, well, other people across the world can't. Um, so we need to think fairly, fairly broadly. Think first, start at the bottom here, quality of life or length of life, what's more important to you? Okay. And some people might sit in the middle of the fence, they want both, as uh -huh. long as their quality of life is okay. But you have to decide what's, what's okay for you. Okay. Then think about the thinking, walking, talking thing. These are things that we do in our everyday life and we, we just probably take them for granted. But what if you couldn't do them like mm. you can now? Would that, be, okay. would that be a deal breaker for you? Mm. Um, okay. Treatment outcomes. You think every treatment we have has an outcome. And generally when we're younger and more healthier, most of our treatment outcomes are, are going to return us to pretty well 100% what we were before. But as we get older and our health changes, maybe that sort of recovery isn't as expected or isn't a, a, as a reasonable expectation any longer, simply because we're getting older. So we need to sort of think about our recovery needs to enable us to do X, Y, and Z, which is the really important things that give us quality in our life. We'll just okay. go back a minute. Okay. okay. Think about circumstances as well. Lots of people talk to us and say, well, I've told the kids, you know, to, um, you know, don't put me on a ventilator. But what if the reason you're being put on the ventilator is a reversible reason and you're expected to recover? Uh, Would you yes, still say yes. the same things to your kids? True. Okay. So because we've got the healthcare system that we've got, we talking about circumstances is, is really important. Mm. Um, you might have other, um, you might have religious, spiritual or cultural issues that are also pretty important to you and that might have an impact on the way that you want decisions made. What mm. about your place of care? Does it matter to you where you are looked after or do you need to be in anywhere where you can get the care that you need to keep you comfortable? Mm. So this wow. conversation, the conversation mm. you have with yourself first Mm -hmm. is a really important one because you need some time. We don't think about all these things the whole time. We don't, we don't, but mm. we need, so we need some time to clarify things in our own head before we start talking to our substitute decision maker, have a talk with your GP to make sure that you're as informed as you need to be about your health and where it might take you in the future. And then talk to your other close family as well. 
because you're trying to, if they're trying to make a decision that's the same decision you would make yourself, mm. you're asking them to step out of their shoes and step into your shoes. Yeah. So you need to you need to be able to um, uh, uh, you need to you need to tell them yeah. what's important to you. They need to hear that from you. Catherine, that that seems like there's there's, there's a great need for a, a very deep and, and important <laughs> conversation. Um, but you, I, I think I agree with you. You need to have that conversation with yourself first. Yep, you do before before sharing it with others. It is, and I'm sure on the website there are uh, materials and uh, and prompts that that make you think of different things, like that that last slide. Think yep. of these different areas yes. uh, and and then fill in those gaps. That's um, right. There is some information on the website about that as well, and some conversation mm. starters because sometimes you're ready to talk to your family, but they're not ready to listen to you. Yeah. But we can give you some conversation starters and talk things through with you and also help um, if you ring our, if people are happy to ring our advisory line, we're happy to talk you through some of those things from that previous slide, this slide here, and okay. help you tease out your own values in life and we, and to sort of to talk to you about the importance of thinking about treatment outcomes and circumstances. And then, and then obviously sitting down and, and writing those down. Mm. Uh, and once again, I, I think you would have to review that on an ongoing basis. Yes, you do. And you can mm. keep it, you can change it for any reason that's important to you as long as you retain your competency. Okay. So competency, again, your capacity, your competency is really mm. important. But having, documenting your wishes in the end, if you can do that, we'd always recommend it because a, a written document Mm -hmm. is seen to be more considered yeah and that can help your family when they're trying to when they're trying to support your decision maker in making treatment decisions for you mm -hmm. people are sort of stressed and emotional it's a help to have something that you've written this is this is the things that are important to me so you can do that by going to our website yeah and it's not it's easily uh it's easy accessed you can go to create your plan page there it's written on the slide and you can just open up the um, the state or territory where you live. And that's where you can get the forms from. You can download those. And there's information generally to explain what advanced care planning is about and what the process is. Yeah. Catherine, can I ask a couple of questions? Mm, sure. Can I include a request for voluntary assisted dying in my directive? Well, the short answer is no, Stuart. Oh, okay. And the reason is, the reason is, because they're, um, both of them are underpinned by two very separate and different legislations. Mm -hmm. um, the processes themselves are very different. Advanced care planning is a process that you put in place while you are competent and it takes effect when you are no longer competent. Okay. Voluntary assisted dying is a process that needs to be started and concluded while you have competency. So they're okay. two very distinct processes, two very separate ones. Yeah. There's nothing to stop anyone from having advanced care planning in place and mm -hmm. also wanting to go down the voluntary assisted dying pathway, mm -hmm. but they are two separate pathways. Yeah, I, I only ask because it's uh, one, one of those uh, topics that's uh, a big buzz at the moment. There's legislation being discussed and, and those sort of things uh, from well, New South right. Wales, I think. And I think it's, that's right. It was tabled mm. in um, New South Wales recently. Mm. Um, all the, I think if it's passed there, that will mean that all the states in Australia mm. have, um, have legislation and it just leaves the two territories. Yeah. Without, okay. um, where I'm not aware that it's been tabled at the moment. Yeah. But it is it will be available pretty well right across Australia. But it's also got um, fairly strict eligibility criteria as well. Yeah. And the only eligibility criteria for advanced care planning mm -hmm. is that you need to be a competent adult. Okay. So can I change my advanced care directive once I've once you've sat down and um, you know how you might review your will every five, yep. ten years or something? Yep. Can I change that that advanced care directive? As long as you remain competent, yeah, you do mm -hmm. need to review your your directive and also your appointment of your decision maker because oh, okay. relationships can change. Mm -hmm. They can predecease you. We'd always recommend that when you appoint a decision maker, 
you appoint a backup person as well because if something happens to your number one decision maker, mm -hmm. you may no longer be um, competent and okay. able to appoint another one at that stage. Yeah. So we'd always recommend to people that, um, that you appoint two uh, at, at the beginning. Um, also, you need, to, you need to review your directive document sort of every, um, every one, two, three years, whatever. There's, no, there's nothing laid down in legislation, but mm -hmm. life changes. Your health certainly mm -hmm. will change. Yeah. So for any reason um, that's uh, important to you, uh, yes, you can change your document. There are slightly different ways that you need to change it or you're able to change it depending on where you live. Yeah. But um, we can help you with that and there's information around that on your um, uh, on the website. It's certainly, once it's on paper, it's certainly not written in stone. Yeah. The last um, thing you'd want is an ex-partner to be um, your um, decision maker. <laughs> That's that. Well, that's one that can be one of the reasons why you would formally appoint somebody else. Mm -hmm. and, and the fact that you've made it a formal appointment lets everybody know, it sends a very clear signal. This is yeah. the person I trust to make decisions around my medical care. Yeah. Mm. Um, okay. So I know where my will is. Mm -hmm. uh, I know who I've appointed to the power of attorney for, for, for all my stuff. Where on earth do I keep my advanced care directive? Okay. The information for this is also on the website as well, and we can talk you through it on the advisory line. But mm. basically, all of your advanced care planning documents, your directive talking about your preferences for medical care and your life values, and your appointment of your substitute decision maker, they're precious documents. They belong to you. They, mm -hmm. they don't belong to your hospital or your doctor's. So it's your responsibility to look after them and keep them safe. Make sure that your substitute decision maker knows where the originals are. Mm -hmm. And you need to distribute your documents uh, widely. You would give a certified copy of their appointment to your substitute decision maker. You give mm -hmm. copies of your directive documents listing your preferences for care to your substitute decision maker and to other close family members who would act like maybe your support team for your decision maker. Hmm. You can contact your GP. Uh, they'd certainly want to know contact details for your decision maker. And then if you've got a medical record at a hospital, you can contact the hospital and say, I've got advanced care planning documents. How do I get them onto my electronic record? And they'd oh, okay. let you know. And then you can, some of the states have got state-based state um, registration centres where, um, where you can lodge them. Um, others, other states don't, but mm -hmm. we've got a national database, our My Health Record. So that's one of the um, what, that's one of the um, uh, locations you can uh, you can um, uh, transfer your documents to as well. But mm. don't just rely on one way of um, storing your documents. They mm. <laughs> they need to be available to have whoever wants them whenever they need them. Yeah. So you distribute them widely and look after your originals. So I see from the slide there that there is a, a, a box for basically every state and territory. Uh, and that, yep. that takes you to uh, all the information that you would need for yes. that state or territory. That's is right. that right? Yes, it's on one page. There are links in and out okay. of, to other information and mm -hmm. you can find the, um, the forms for appointing a substitute decision maker uh, mm -hmm. in your state or territory, plus the forms for the um, directive document for your care preferences. They've all yep. got different names, which is confusing because we haven't got a, um, we haven't got a national legislation, but mm. all you need to know is the correct name for the state or territory where you live. Yeah, so, and that, that information could obviously yes. be found in those links. Yes. Now, the other fine. thing, uh, Catherine, that I believe Advanced Care uh, Planning does is free presentations. Yes. Uh, and um, different sheds could uh, contact advanced care planning and it would be a virtual presentation um, but if you're in melbourne or victoria um, there's a possibility of an actual face-to-face -face presentation is that right it depends um we travel in a small area around the, okay. the austin catchment but it depends where it is okay. and um uh, we would um, one of our managers would certainly be happy to talk to people about that 
but on 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 the whole if if one way or the other you can get a presentation yeah. whether it be online or whether it uh, be face to face and uh, uh, there's always, there's also some courses i believe uh, we've that... got a separate yes we've got a um uh we've got some videos and case studies on our main website and we've also got a separate um e-learning website where there's videos yeah. on different aspects of advanced care planning for people who want a, um, a little bit of a deeper understanding. We've got a vo um, good videos, good information about being a substitute decision maker. And uh, we can sort of let people know about um, uh, those if they want to call the service. But there are, certain, there are certain videos that you can access through the main website as well. Fabulous. Okay, yeah, so as my... Information. Uh, as, as my son would say, you can educate yourself. Yes, you can. We're a one-stop <laughs> shop for anything to do with advanced care planning, Stuart. Catherine, it's been absolutely fascinating talking to you and learning all about advanced care planning and advanced care directives. It's a huge subject, a uh, very important subject, mm -hmm. and I, I um, uh, advocate for everybody and anybody um, in and out of Shed World to, to go to advanced care planning's website uh, and inform yourself and maybe have that uh, important conversation with a loved one uh, that allows them to assist you when you can't assist yourself. Is that right? That's right, Stuart. And there's another way of putting it as well, mm -hmm. that we're all traveling on to the same destination and we can't change that. True we that. can change the way that we get there. Absolutely. Yes. Catherine, thank you very much for uh, the opportunity to okay. discuss thank this. Thank you, Stuart. And uh, thanks for all the information. Really appreciate it.